Radical Two Kingdoms people say it's not our job to build the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is separate from this world. Clearly I disagree with that, given that this series is literally called Kingdom Craft. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we craft the kingdom. We build the kingdom of God in Minecraft to symbolize how we're supposed to build the kingdom of God in real life. Today I'm going to be working on a university in Minecraft that is connected to the church that I also built in Minecraft. Because building universities and hospitals are ways that Christians historically have built the kingdom of God by transforming the culture. But this idea is rejected by people who adhere to radical two kingdoms theology. Radical Two Kingdoms asserts that it's really not the church's job to transform the culture in any way. That the only job of the church to be the kingdom of God here on earth is to proclaim the word and administer the sacraments. Basically just handling people's spiritual lives, but there's nothing physical about the kingdom of God. Now, regular Two Kingdoms theology, that's just what the Protestant reformers taught, that the religious and secular spheres should be separate, and in the secular sphere, we can cooperate with non-Christians in things like science and law, we can appeal to natural law, and we can have some sort of earthly common ground with unbelievers. This is why I critiqued presuppositionalism in the previous video, because presuppositionalism tends to deny that we can have any common ground with unbelievers. But classical Two Kingdoms theology is just the original definition of separation of church and state. Martin Luther believed in two kingdoms, believed church and state should be separate, but he still believed blasphemy should be illegal. Even the Puritans, yeah, those guys who did the Salem Witch Trials, they believed in separation of church and state. So whenever someone says they believe in separation of church and state, I'm like, you want to be like the Puritans? So do I. So radical Two Kingdoms theology just takes the ideas of regular Two Kingdoms theology to their extremes. Radical Two Kingdoms theology says that the religious sphere, the church, shouldn't have any influence on the culture. We both agree that the kingdom of God is here now, but the radical Two Kingdoms people don't think the kingdom of God has any influence on this world. Whereas classical Two Kingdoms strongly believes the church should transform the world. I am a mainline Protestant, and one of the core tenets of mainline Protestantism is we spread the kingdom of God not just by spreading our theological beliefs, but by serving the poor and healing the sick. Historically, the church has done that by advocating for justice in society and things like building hospitals for the kingdom of God. That is the central tenet of mainline Protestant theology, and this comes from recognizing that Jesus' main message in the Gospels is the kingdom of God here on earth. Now, sadly, in mainline Protestantism, there are a lot of mainline churches that put a liberal spin on the idea of the kingdom of God and say that the kingdom of God is like wokeness or whatever. But historically speaking, the kingdom of God has been completely anti-woke. It's been Christianity basically transforming society and uh, infiltrating the society with Christian values. Now, in my previous video, I explained why I'm not a presuppositionalist. There are a lot of presuppositionalists in the Reformed, uh, Reformed theology world. But in some ways, the radical Two Kingdoms position is the opposite end of the theological spectrum from presuppositionalism. Here's what I mean. Presuppositionalism says that Christians and non-Christians can have absolutely no common ground. It's basically a very militarist, uh, or at least a very militant form of Christianity, that there's no common ground with unbelievers. Christian society and the Christian worldview just has to completely conquer all anti-Christian worldviews because all non-Christian worldviews are satanic worldviews. Radical Two Kingdoms is in the radical opposite direction. Um, whereas presuppositional presuppositionalism says the Christian worldview and culture needs to completely conquer the world, Radical Two Kingdoms says the Christian worldview should not have any impact on the rest of the world because that's just not its job. The only job of the church right now is to preach the gospel, like as in the intellectual message of the gospel, and to save individual souls, but not to transform the culture collectively. So I think historic mainline Protestant theology rejects both of those things. We reject presuppositionalism because we think it's important to establish some earthly common ground with the secular world, because there are things we need to work together on, like the environment and stuff. But at the same time, um, the church does need to be salt and light in the world. That was Jesus' command. Jesus said, um, 
B, you are salt and light. What does salt do? Salt preserves what is good. It's the church's job to preserve what is good already in the world, not to completely annihilate the, um, the way things are and replace it with something completely brand new. The church's job is to be redemptive, to redeem what is already there and to fix what is not good. I feel like both ends of the spectrum can lead to a sort of retreatist mindset in society. If you have a radical um, presuppositionalist, and most presuppositionalists are post-millennial, a more radical post-millennial mindset can say, we can retreat from society now because we know the church is just going to conquer the world in the future. And the radical two kingdoms mindset says that it's never the church's job to transform society, so the church doesn't need to get involved in the cultural institutions or anything because that's just not its job. But I think um, the historic mainline position is somewhere in between those. Like, the Radical Two Kingdoms, as we know it today, is a pretty recent thing, it seems. It emerges out of the Escondido Theological School from, from Escondido, California. Um, and a lot of my favorite theologians are from there. Michael Horton is one of my favorite Reformed theologians. I'd say he's probably the best Reformed theologian alive today. He's very good at defending the truly Reformed view of the sacraments, for example. A lot of Reformed people see the sacraments as more symbolic, and it's very good that Michael Horton has sort of helped revive the truly Reformed view. And Michael Horton is great about Calvin's doctrine of union with Christ, almost like a Calvinist version of theosis, which everyone assumes is just an Eastern Orthodox doctrine. But when it comes to the Kingdom of God, um, Michael Horton and the Radical Two Kingdoms Escondido Seminary guys are dog crap. I'm sorry. Because one of Michael Horton's quotes that I think is absolutely insane is, it is not our job to build the kingdom. Well, I think that defeats the entire purpose of the Ascension. Right before the Ascension, the disciples asked Jesus, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, is Jesus going to finally usher in the golden age that everyone in Israel had been waiting for? And Jesus said, it's, it's not up to you to know when this is going to happen. But then after Jesus sends into heaven and the disciples just stay, like, gaping, the angel appears to them and he's like, get off your butts and start working. Uh, he probably had, didn't have that accent, but the angel basically said, you guys have to start working, implying that the reason Jesus ascended into heaven is to leave the work of building the kingdom up to his people. Because Jesus wants to involve his people. God wants to involve his people. So what the Radical Two Kingdoms people will say is, yes, the kingdom of God is now in that Jesus is reigning in heaven, but we don't do anything to build the kingdom. Jesus is going to build the kingdom, and we're just kind of along for the ride. Now, it's not like we, it's not like Jesus needs our help or anything, but because God is gracious and God loves us, God wants to involve us in the work of creation. Because in the Garden of Eden, um, God told humanity to have dominion over creation. God cares about the redemption of creation, not just individual souls, but the physical creation. And that leads me to my next point. Radical Two Kingdoms often seems to imply that the only thing the gospel is for is our individual souls and maybe our bodies, but the gospel is for individuals, it's not for creation as a whole. And that does not seem biblical. In Romans 8, it says the creation groans in eager expectation, that the creation is waiting to be redeemed. The gospel is not just about the redemption of individual people to be saved off the sinking ship of this horrible planet. The gospel is about the redemption of creation. The, the Bible says Christ's hold, hold, Christ holds all of creation together. So that means the resurrection of Christ will eventually bring with it the resurrection and redemption of all creation. Uh, generally, Christian theologians have said that the, dis the, the destruction of creation that Second Peter talks about is not actually a destruction as an annihilation, but more of a purification. The destructive fires are really just imagery for purification. When it says the world will be destroyed, what it really means is everything bad in the world will be destroyed. The ways of this world will be destroyed. And we think this because the Bible in many other places says all things will be redeemed, all good things will be restored. Generally speaking, Radical Two Kingdoms theologians like David Van Drunen, David Van Drunen is probably the most radical Radical Two Kingdoms theologian, he says that the church shouldn't even serve the poor, help the poor. They, he would say individual Christians on their own time should feed the poor and stuff, but they shouldn't do that necessarily as the church. David Van Drunen has said that we have no 
a reason to think that great things of this world will be in the world to come. Like, for example, Johann Sebastian Bach's music. The best music ever written for the glory of God. It's objectively the best music. Um, m most common sense Christians would say that, of course, uh, Bach's music, either that or like an even better version of it, I don't see how you can make it any better, is going to be in the new heavens and the new earth. Because there is a general motif throughout all of scripture that all good things will be restored. But these radical two kingdoms theologians, they say no, the things of this world won't necessarily be in the new heavens and the new earth. The new heavens and new earth will be something radically different. There's not going to be much continuity. The only thing that's going to continue from this world to the next is us. And it's almost the docetist heresy which denies that the physical is going to be redeemed. Whereas the transformationalist view, or you could call it the Kuyperian view, because um, Kuyper was another modernish reformed theologian, Dutch reformed guy who was also the prime minister of the Netherlands, who strongly advocated for a transformational view. So sometimes the transformational view is called Kuyperianism. That's definitely what I fall under. The transformationalist view is that everything good will be restored and will be present in some way in the new heavens and the new earth. So that means, let's say you had uh, a Minecraft world when you were a little kid, and that Minecraft world got deleted. I think that Minecraft world, in some way, I don't know how, but in some way will be in the new heavens and the new earth. How do I know? Because there's a promise that all creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay. That means everything sad is going to come untrue, as Tim Keller says. And my favorite theologian who talks about this is N.T. Wright. Nobody explains the kingdom of God better than N.T. Wright. You cannot understand eschatology at all without listening to N.T. Wright. I know he's sketchy on some other issues, but on eschatology, he is so epic that it makes up for it completely. N.T. Wright says, you're not oiling the wheels of a car that's about to drive off a cliff. We're not rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I think that um, if Christians have this mindset that this whole world is just going to be nuked by God, it sort of destroys our motivation to work for the kingdom and to create stuff. The whole kingdom craft server, all these people making beautiful things for the kingdom, it's about creating for God's kingdom. What's the purpose of creating if you think that this stuff is not going to last? If you had a Minecraft world that you knew was going to be deleted tomorrow, would you build anything beautiful on it? Of course not. The reasons Christians have uh, written some amazing pieces of music, I'm not talking about Hillsong. I don't think Hillsong is going to be in the new creation. I'm kidding, but also not. Um, but the reason Christians like Handel and Bach have written such amazing pieces to the glory of God, the reason they've built so many amazing cathedrals, is because God wants to involve us in the work of creation and new creation. There is something truly redemptive about creating beautiful, amazing things in the name of Jesus Christ. And every good thing done in the name of Christ will last forever. That's what I strongly believe, because, of course, Jesus is really the one who lasts forever, who has eternal life. But Jesus holds all things together. So like I said, the resurrection of Christ will bring with it the resurrection of all creation. So there's gonna the gospel has a cosmic dimension to it that everyone neglects. That's why even as a Calvinist who believes in limited atonement, we can say Jesus died for everyone in a sense, because even if not all individual souls will be redeemed, um, Jesus died for the creation as a whole, because sin doesn't just affect our individual souls. Sin affects the physical creation, and Jesus died to redeem that. So we can really say that Jesus died for the world. Um, when the Bible says, for God so loved the world, we don't need to put an asterisk at the end of that saying, oh, the world just means like all different types of people. I know some Calvinists have tried to interpret it like that, but that's, that's ridiculous, come on. God loves the entire world. God even loves the non-elect, even if they won't eventually be saved, and even if um, God loves them in one sense and hates them in another sense, God's, it's still right to say God loves everyone. I've, I think I've made a video about that. If not, then I'm going to. But that's, that's off topic. The point is that all of creation will be redeemed, and that means everything good in creation. And now, I would take it a bit further than some people would. I would take it further than some transformationalist or Kuyperian theologians would. I think every individual animal, not just all types of animals, but every individual animal will be present in the new heavens and new earth. I think uh, your pet, your pet's going to be in heaven. I really think so. You know why? Well, animals do not sin. And animals still suffer. The problem of human suffering can be explained by human sin. We all deserve hell, so anything less than hell is a blessing. But why do animals suffer? It's really hard to explain that without believing that God will give them some sort of compensation. We don't know for sure, because the Bible doesn't say what happens to animals after they die. 
we do have a sense that animals have souls in some sense, not rational souls the way humans do, but with like Balaam's donkey, um, we do we do get the sense that animals have feelings. Animals can hurt in the same sense that humans can hurt, even if they don't have a rational soul. They have what Aristotle would call a appetitive soul, or I don't know, whatever. But the point is, animals need some compensation if God is just. If God allows animals to suffer without compensation, that would make God unjust. So, so any amount of suffering can be justified if there is an eternity of bliss to make up for it. And that is in line with this idea that all of creation, animals are part of creation, of course, all of creation will be restored and redeemed. So that's why I unironically think all dogs go to heaven, not just dogs, all, all cats, all squirrels, um, even all mosquitoes and ticks. I don't know how that's going to work, and um, I don't know if bug spray is going to be in heaven, but the Bible says the lion will lay down with the lamb. I guess it could also just as easily say the mosquito will lay down with the human. I can see why it didn't say that. It's The Bible doesn't need to give every example. It's not an exhaustive textbook of what's going to happen. But yeah, the mosquito and the tick will lay down with the human. The dog will lay down with the mailman. That is the gospel hope we have as Christians. That is what we look forward to in the future, the restoration of all things. And so our job as the church is to participate in God's work of reconciling all things to himself in anticipation of when Jesus is going to come back and fully consummate his kingdom. God's kingdom is here right now in the already not sen already not yet sense. Both uh, Radical Two Kingdoms people and the Kuyperians like me are generally amillennials in that we believe God's kingdom is already here, but they don't think God's kingdom has much of an impact on this world, whereas Kuyperians believe that God's kingdom transforms this world. Abraham Kuyper talked a lot about how we're supposed to redeem all areas of life. Christians should redeem the arts, redeem science, redeem music, redeem everything, because God's kingdom is holistic. That's kind of what I'm trying to do with this Minecraft server. I'm trying to redeem Minecraft by having a Christian Minecraft server where people build beautiful churches everywhere. I'm trying to participate and invite other people to participate in God's redeeming work. I know a Minecraft server is not nearly as important as other things, but I want the Minecraft server to sort of be a picture of how people could do things in the real world. I want to be very clear, I'm not saying Minecraft is a substitute for the real world. But all things in creation will be, uh, will be restored. But the Radical Two Kingdoms people generally tend to agree with premillennials, people who have a premillennial eschatology, that the world is a sinking ship, the creation is not going to be redeemed, and we just have to get off this sinking ship of the creation before it all explodes. Now, there are Bible passages that seem to say this world's going to be destroyed, but in the Bible, the world sometimes refers to the creation, and sometimes refers to, like, the authorities and principalities that run the world, aka Satan. Satan and all the evil powers of this world are going to be are going to be destroyed, but the creation itself is going to be redeemed, and we have to draw that distinction. The world is going to be purged of everything evil, but because Satan has been bound for a thousand years, that's just an image. Satan still does things in the world, but we are we as the church have the ability to go out into the world and transform it, and I believe that is the gospel call. That is an essential part of the gospel, and that is why I reject radical two kingdoms theology.